integrated in all sorts of platforms. But um, like I said, this is the management perspective, so let's perhaps go a bit more technical. Um, well, last night, actually, I spent some time trying to um, update the, uh, the server architecture um, diagram um, for the 3.1 release. Um, I realized this is a fairly complex picture, and to make it worse, I could probably talk about each of these components for a while. So I will just try to give you a little bit of the uh, overall picture of how the server is constructed, because Colab, from the beginning, has been very security-minded and centric, um, due to the background, quite openly. Since um, Colab goes back to the year 2002, which is when the German um, Federal Office for Information um, security, information technology security, the BSE, BS, the Bundesamt für Sicherheit in der Informationstechnologie, needed a group of solution they could trust. And trust for them was defined as fully open source, fully open standards, and it had to have certain functional requirements such as cross platform and so on and so forth. Colab came out of that. And um, this is now the third um, generation of that technology, conceptually um, still based on the initial concept but um, has evolved in several aspects um, over time, and of course some parts of the stack had to be updated, which is what we did in the past two years. Colab 3, which came earlier this year, was the first release of the fully refactored stack. Now, um, let's start at the heart of it. Um, Colab is based on an IMAP server, um, and the IMAP server for us, in fact, is the database. Um, that when you hear it for the first time, it seems strange to some people, but actually IMAP is a ridiculously good choice for storing large amounts of data um, in a way that you can share between users in a very controlled and secure fashion. Because the IMAP servers themselves obviously need to be able to enforce ACL as well, and they need to be able to handle also the large attachments and, and bigger blobs that in any way you throw at them. So using your IMAP server, you um, essentially, this is obviously not a SQL storage in a way, it's a NoSQL approach. Um, it's a file on disk at the, at the simplest, um, which has a whole lot of um, advantages starting from scalability. You can scale IMAP servers to virtually any size. Um, you have all sorts of possibilities with some of the servers out there to attach them to object-based storages, to all sorts of very interesting storage concepts you can get all those advantages in through the IMAP storage route, which is quite nice. Our current default storage is Cyrus. Um, we, in fact, are actively involved also with the Cyrus community. Um, we've done deployments on Cyrus murder setups where you have multiple front ends and back ends and you can combine them very nicely. But um, we also um, can integrate on top of Dovecot, in fact, Timo, has just last week, if I remember correctly, uh, put the um, requirement for Dovecut to be a native backend into the main trunk of Dovecut now. Um, so you should be able, I mean, it's last week, so we haven't really tested it a whole lot, but you should now be able to just hook in a Dovecut server as well. And if you already run an IMAP server, that means you already have, essentially, the core of your Colab server, if you want one. Um, you can keep your existing setup, and just make it do full bookware. Um, it's then the, for those of you who want to deal with deeper technical, it's RFC 5464 that defines metadata, which allows you to then say this folder is a calendar, this folder is an address book, that folder is um, a task list, um, and this way the clients um, know what to do. So that's where your data lives. The other central part of it is obviously the whole user management realm, so passwords, um, in particular the whole authentication and credential realm, for that, we use directory services, LDAP by default. Our default choice is the 389 directory server, um, which also is the Red Hat Enterprise directory server, for the simple reason that it is a very strong roles concept. With the roles, you can do very magical things in the way you run your installation. Um, so especially when you're looking at, say, an ISP scenario, um, you can, in one You can, in one installation, in fact, oh. <laughs> <laughs> really went away. Yes. Um, you can, in one installation, um, define multiple roles, including even how the front end behaves, 
say this user only gets web mail, that user gets IMAP access, that user can send mail, that user cannot send mail. You can define all of this through roles. So you have one installation where through the roles you can very fine grained control what which user can do and you can simply say, you know, the user now is a full grouper user, the, that user can use ActiveSync, that user can use CalDAV. And you can just de um, define the roles as you need them for your installation and you can then control which user can do what based on what role they have assigned. Um, of course, we also support OpenLDAP. Um, Sun Directory Server is um, like 3.9, um, a descendant of the um, old uh, Netscape uh, realm. And just for the kicks of it, we even hooked this up to MSI Active Directory natively, um, just to see whether we could and we can. Um, so we are very, very agnostic when it comes to directory services. We've, as part of the right refactoring, we've thrown out virtually all the, the special LDAP schemas that were in Colab 2. So if you've looked at Colab 2, um, Colab 3 has gotten rid of all of that craft. Um, we've, we've stripped it down to the, to the bare basics that you find anywhere, only what we need and reused what we could. Um, and so this way now we are extremely agnostic. So these two is where, I mean, these are where the user is, and this is where the payload is, right? Which means that's your heart area, that's the heart zone that you want to protect. Um, so that is um, the part that you always want to make sure that you can keep safe. And you can put that as far behind as many layers of network as you want, and as many levels of filtering and protection as you want, because everything else that happens in here is ultimately network. Um, it's always network based um, on secure protocols. You can um, set this whole thing up so that every of these lines uses PS <coughs> by default. Um, so you have a very, very strong encryption in the server built into the architecture. Then, um, let's have a look at briefly the mail flow. So mail comes in, goes out, obviously. Um, also with PFS by default um, when we deliver the stack. Then um, you have the classic um, spam filtering stack in there um, with MFSD, Clam up Spam Assassin, and nothing new there. This is, I think, what we've all been using for quite a while now. Um, and then we have a little mo module that is called Wallace, which in fact is a Python-based module that allows you to generate modules, and you, to hook modules into your mail flow that can do to your mail flow whatever you want, ultimately, incoming or outgoing. So you just, if you can code it in Python, you can do it. It's fairly easy to do, so what you can do is one customer was concerned, a large, large company, they had you know umbrella company with ma many businesses inside, they had a Robinson scenario where you know if company A has a, has a customer that has never ever sent me mail again, and company B then somehow sends, sends, sends mail, they should still be able to send to that same customer. So you needed in the mail flow a way to say if that mail comes on company B, let it through, otherwise, you know, don't send to that user. So we um, actually, for them, uh, had a Wallace module that then allows them to make that decision. <coughs> Which looks at the recipient, looks at the database, see is this on the Robinson list for that center, yes, no, um, and then manipulates the mail flow that way. Of course, all of this um, as known, then the collab daemon is what controls the whole thing that typically sits somewhere in a very secure realm as well, but um, ultimately what it does, it talks LDAP to the LDAP server and um, IMAP protocol to the IMAP server, and um, it monitors the directory service, for instance, when you say I create a new user, then the Colab daemon will pick that up and it will create the mailbox on the IMAP server, stuff like that. Um, it's a bit of your administrative um, part. It is also offering, um, it's based on Python as well, PyColab, it's offering you the full realm of shell commands, so you can do things like list and set quotas, and you can set quotas per folder, right? So you can say different folder for archive, then for inbox, then for whatever, um, anywhere in your tree. Um, you can um, restore mailboxes from here, and you can do something that by the powers of IMAP replaces your backup in quite a few scenarios, because IMAP has a concept called expunge, or delayed expunge, I should say. So you m mark something as deleted, and it disappears for the user, but it's still there, right? And it's still on the hard disk. So what you can do is you can unexpunge this one object, and voila, you have it back. Which means I can do this for any object type. Say that calendar entry I deleted last week, or 
that task I deleted, you know, a month ago. Depending on how long your unexpand, your ex automatic expunge interval is, um, you kill up to 99% of the backup requirements that you may have in terms of, you know, um, user phones, help desk says, help, help, help. Um, here you just, you can do this through the shell command or call out even very easily. You just say, you know, that, I, that inbox, okay, yeah, please, that message. Here it is again. And of course, that also means we can back this up with any backup solution out there. I mean, everything can backup files, everything. Um, so it doesn't really matter what backup solution is there, we can integrate into that environment very well, which is um, one of the big advantages here as well, to Rhino. Then we offer here a server API, which is essentially RESTful, although I'm not sure whether it actually meets the formal um, REST specifications. It's basically implemented in the JSON over HTTPS thing, and it works with the credentials of whoever is authenticated in the web administration panel. So there is a web administration panel that we deliver with um, the whole thing, which is a self-forming interface. Um, it queries what capabilities it has and then only shows you what you can do. Um, and actually shows you correctly what you can do. And that web administration panel um, then adjusts to whatever um, you want to be able to do. And it's very easily extensible. So for instance, the web admin panel in our um, corporate server allows me to also set my voice mail um, pin and stuff like that. Um, so I can just hook my asterisk and whatever in there. So, um, but this of course also allows you to, put, to, auto to integrate this with any other management system you may have, right? If, you have, if you're running a large installation, um, if you have some other form of user management of whatever you want to do with your domain for ISPs as well, um, then you know here you can actually hook any logic that you already have into the control path for this solution. Um, so this in some way is an optional component, um, but um, it's part of the standard package because if you don't have anything, it pretty much solves your problem. And then, of course, up there, the entire web bank of, um, of uh, access. Um, you have in here, um, I mean, we can run this on Apache or Nginx, um, both work fine. And um, so we have the admin panel, of course, then we have the web client um, and its individual components. So that is um, webmailer is Runcube. We are um, deeply integrated with the Runcube community. Um, in fact, the two main authors of Runcube work for Colab Systems full time. And everything from version 0 0.7 of Runcube 8, 9, and so on and so forth um, has been to 80, 90% our work. Um, we also have a calendar um, task module, um, a very, very powerful address book, which also goes back upstream, and um, also a little file um, module with some optional things that I'm going to show you. All of this is then based on the Runcube framework, um, and you have as well there, CalDAV, CardDAV, and WebDAV <coughs> as of 3.1. So you can synchronize your calendars, your address book um, with any kind of device, natively into, into Mac um, platforms, and so on and so forth. And um, can do the same also with ActiveSync for all the devices that prefer ActiveSync. Um, mainly iPhones, all the iOS devices are very strong in ActiveSync, not very good on everything else. So um, very often, if you have a mixed environment, you would use ActiveSync for some devices and CalDAV CardDAV for others. Um, and if you have a native CoLab client, of course, they would just use IMAP um, and um, would then simply, through disconnected IMAP, have, in fact, full offline capability. And that is what the main CoLab client on the desktop, which is KDE PIM contact, does. I mean, it just does disconnected IMAP which is very robust against bad network conditions. It can resynchronize very well. You can work offline. You can then, you know, when you get back online, it just resynchronize, it just uploads um, to the IMAP server what is new and downloads um, what, this, what has happened on the server in the meantime. So all of this actually works very nicely um, and very, very robustly. I mean, the, the protocol level of IMAP in terms of resynchronization, all of these things, tracking what has changed on the server with the advanced protocols. We have some RFCs now that allow us to say, has anything changed? And the server just says, no, and that's good. I mean, then, you know, we can go very, very effective here. And in fact, a lot of that has happened already in the um, web client. And then the, uh, the last box here is um, the SQL um, cache, typically. 
um, and often we also have a memcached for storage. These two um, are shared, by the way, between all the um, web client components that you see there that are based on the Runcube framework. So um, we have a very nice um, efficient caching mechanism. So it is no SQL in the sense of not only SQL. We use SQL where it makes sense, where the data is actually related in some way. Um, but um, the payload itself is in the IMAP server. Otherwise, everything else can principle explode. So if, if you have a backup of this, you have your data, um, which is um, the nice part. And then, of course, I can network zone this very well. And plus, I can traffic monitor between the different components. I can say, you know, between this layer here, um, I only allow standard IMAP because we are very careful to stay within the standard. We do not extend the standard, so I can even do like a proxy in the middle that monitors my comments as for whether or not all those comments that go over the pipeline are actually proper. So in case someone tries to break in here uh, and tries to send wonky comments, they don't even go further. Um, and that's the last part for this one. User credentials and permissions only up there. So there's never ever any escalated privilege anywhere in here. Um, and very much by design because we we personally think web technologies are incredibly hard to secure, um, very, very difficult. So generally, we assume that a very dedicated attacker will always find a way to break in. If it's on the web, somewhere accessible, it's very hard to secure web applications. It's really, really not trivial. I mean, you can, of course, you can get the more secure and you can do many good things, but at the end of the day, we figure it's better to not trust that layer um, because we don't have to. We can build the system without having to. Um, so all of this, this user logs in with their own credentials, gets their session token, um, and then only that session token is ever um, used. Um, because I can use memcached session storage, I can build this up as a farm where the user can, between two requests, hit two different web servers. Generally, even if you have this in a multi-data center setup where they are all active, you could even hit different data centers between two clicks <coughs> on your web client and wouldn't even notice. So that's the service setup. I mean, it's a technical talk, so I figure I can go a bit technical. And I, I, I can actually, I mean, you might notice I'm excited about this stuff because I think it's actually really, really interesting technology. Um, I love my team for, for building this. So then just one last bit here. Native client, um, you're, if you have an application that in any way does IMAP, it is already almost a native Colab server, very client. Um, because all you need to do in order to make this a fully um, capable Colab client is you need to take the lib Colab, which integrates the lib Colab XML. Because all our storage um, is based on IMAP and in the IMAP XML objects, um, XCal and XCart, which we read and write through a generated piece of code, which is called um, lib. Colab XML, and that library then allows me to touch any of my objects. The lib Colab, which wraps around it, is ultimately providing me with some of the, the wrapping, the serialization, deserialization functions, things like that, and can then be through generated API be integrated into any code base, PHP, Python, C++, you name it. Your, you name your language, essentially, um, this can do it. So now you have a set of libraries that is already there, that's on most platforms. I mean, it's in Debian by now, it's definitely on Fedora, it's in Zuse, so I mean, it's, it's virtually going into all the distros. We've been working with all the distros to get it in there. So all you need to do now is essentially address that library and say, I need a calendar entry, and it will give you a calendar object. Um, so you just need to write that last little bit of logic that hooks into your application based on whatever it is you want to do, and you have a native Colab client that can then use all the native advantages of doing direct IMAP against the server. Um, so it's gotten as easy as possible, obviously also with the idea of making it very, very easy for people to write applications that in some way hook in with Colab because there's a whole lot of ideas that you can have immediately once you um, have you know, task management, calendars, added books, um, in all these various aspects, once you have them all, and then you want to integrate them with other applications, but also, perhaps not centrally, but in some other way, need any of that functionality, it's very easy to backend here. 
questions. Um, how does this look? And I just thought I'd, I'd show you a little bit of, um, for those who haven't seen it yet, a little bit of, uh, of imagery. Now, what you see here is obviously um, the webmail, also known as RunQ. Um, like I said, we integrate extremely strongly with upstream communities. So RunQ itself is still an independent project. It is self-run. Um, even though Thomas Bruderli, the initial author and architect of RunQ, works for us, we do not tell him how to run that project, ever. That's a strict no-no. Just like we don't interfere um, in how KDE PIM runs this project. I mean, we participate, we have opinions, and we give those opinions, we share them, we also have sometimes feedback from what our users tell us or things like that, and of course all of this goes in there, but we don't make the decision. Um, those community projects are always self-run by the community, to us that is extremely important. So we try to be the best possible citizen in a free software ecosystem. Um, so Thomas runs Roncube. He made the call, by the way, that Roncube should stay a web mail application, and all the additional modules should not be part of Roncube proper. He said he wanted it slimmer as a pure web mail application. That application is used on hundreds of thousands of sites. I think the last count was like 500,000 sites or something. So I don't know how many million people are using this, but quite a few. Um, so we've been contributing everything upstream. I mean, there's nothing we keep back. Um, if the upstream wants it, it's there. Um, if the upstream doesn't want it, then it goes into git pull up org and then you can pull it from there. Address book. Now, address book, I, I thought about this, but I'm absolutely certain by now we have the leading address book in the other realm. Um, so we can do extremely, and I mean extremely complex LDAP um, scenarios with hundreds of thousands of entries and very, very complex group structures. Um, primarily because our customers required this and we just put it all the way back to the community distro. So um, you have here um, the full VLV paginated search thing going on, everything. We even now have a group navigation for people with too many subgroups to really easily display because, so one of the customers is the schools in Basel. And what they do is, so all the schools in the city of Basel, that's about 35,000 people, so students, um, teachers, administrators, um, use this to manage all their staff, right? So they get from the city administration essentially a dump out of their proprietary management application that says which student is in which class, which teacher is responsible, and so on and so forth. And so they have group structure based on the schools, then the classes, and so on and so forth. So it, you can imagine that this actually gets rather complex when you have a whole city of schools. Um, so they had a very, very huge LDAP tree, ultimately, with lots of um, subgroups everywhere. And um, to make it worse, then you don't want to show everyone everything, but uh, because then, you know, for one it's data protection issue, for the other one it's actually um, infeasible to be able to search that full complexity. But still, I mean, even if you just are a teacher in, say, three schools, and you have then the address books, um, from all the classes you teach with all the students in there, it gets pretty complex. So we needed the, the very good navigation through the um, substructure. Um, so now you, you can actually have like groups and you, you can slide in and this whole thing kind of slides a little bit in that direction. So you can, you can step in and step out and you can search the whole thing very easily. I mean, all the web applications actually um, have the search bar which has the little Thing here where you can customize what you want to search and it works the same across all the applications. Calendar. Um, calendar is, is one of those applications that is a whole lot of work and people don't realize how much work it is unless they try to build one. Um, because calendaring is one of those things that's very, very difficult to get right. It's very easy to screw it up. Um, to build something that works for 90% of the cases, but then those 10% are in, insol insolvable, essentially. Um, so we've spent a lot of time on the calendar as well. So this is the month view. You have um, the, uh, of course, this is the opening new, uh, um, event. You have a day view, week as well, um, and an agenda view, which is just the uh, list of stuff that's coming. You um, also have 
um, hidden behind the, the search bar, which allows you to say something like um, Gothenburg. And then I would only see all events that have Gothenburg somewhere in the, the searchable fields. Um, and that then works across all the views, so I can actually narrow down my view in the calendar based on search terms very um, nice and very fast, which works extremely well. Full sharing, of course, so you have a um, shared calendar here. Um, I mean, all of these dialogues work the exact same way. All the ACLs work the exact same way because they're IMAP-based ACLs, which also means I have very good fine-grained control where I can even say that user gets to write to that folder, but they cannot read from that folder. Um, I mean, I can do all sorts of very interesting um, things with this. And of course, all, you know, secretaries and uh, all the stuff you need in a book where that's used in a company, actually. Recurrence, participants, which also leads you to the whole free busy thing. So we can do free busy exchange, of course, on the server, but also We've done integrations against more, more complex scenarios where you have like an exchange server that provides free busy and your call app server that provides free busy and you have users that are mixed between the two and they should still be able to see each other's free busy. That kind of stuff we've done. It's possible. It's always a bit of work, but um, it's all possible. But um, as you can probably tell by now, um, the complexity here lies simply, simply in the problem and while we use lots of standard components and participate and always put into the upstream everything we do in those components, and we are very careful, by the way, also to protect the entire option space of any of these components. So anything that these components could do before they became part of Colab setup, they can do after. We never ever mandate any narrowing down of functionality in any of these components, deliberately so, but that of course makes the whole space rather complex. Um, so we provide the colab.org distribution as a kind of, to get <coughs> you started, you know, all the packages are there and there's even a setup script that sets you up with a fully running installation on a single server. But since you can make this as complex as you want, um, you know, at some point you will have to do configuration management either by hand, which we don't recommend, or through something like Puppet, which we use regularly for maintaining lots of Then, tasks. The task module, I think, we need to be talking about a little bit more. I, I made this one last night, in fact. Um, this is um, GTD-based to some extent, but it can do the full complexity of what tasks really can, um, can do. The only thing it currently does not really model is um, attendees to tasks, but that's always a very difficult uh, modeling, and typically you can get around that simply by using folders for the same purpose, like group folders. Um, and that's what most people do. In fact, when Outlook ma manages group tasks, that's exactly what it does. Um, they don't use the whole attendee thing because semantically it's actually not fully defined, which is not a problem. So you, what you can see here, and this is the important flag, um, you see there is some completion bars here. In fact, I estimated last night that at this point in, I would be that complete in my talk um, by this point in time. You see the, the, the complete of things. Um, and uh, um, I can create new tasks easily here. What I can also do is I can tag them. And I see this is not really very visible. But these are numbers that show me how often that tag appears among the tags that I currently see. If I were to select one of them, this whole thing would resort itself. And also the numbers would change. And then I would have a very easy way of finding, uh, like narrowing down my view based on the tags that I have. It's a, um, it's a fairly nice setup that works for us. We use it um, every day in our business, in fact, to manage the um, workflows that we have. So we have defined set of tags that are get applied based on where something is in the process. It's slightly kanban y in a way. Um, I, mean, I see Henry nodding, but yeah, I mean, he, he, he knows this stuff. But in a way, we, we, we bastardize this for kanban style approach. And we play with this because these kind of workflows are always evolving. and. Um, we believe very firmly in dog food, so we eat what we write. Um, that means we hit many of the problems first, which is good. Um, and the task module has seen a lot of improvements, so um, I would in fact suggest to have a look at that because um, I'm very happy with the work um, people did on this. Then you have, of course, FileCloud in there as well. Um, this is an uh, application that is impronounceable practically because 
it is the Polish word word um, chlaba, um, which uh, is um, in fact the uh, Polish word for glory. Alex Alexander Machniak wrote this, and um, one of the core Ronkit developers and uh, also um, part of Cola Systems. And you can see folder structure here. You have um, a pre-sorting based on the um, on the type. I mean, it's, it's simplified. It's not um, as as complete and not as many features as OwnCloud, for instance, of course. In fact, you can use, if you um, have your own cloud public installation, you can hook OwnCloud into the back end here because what we've done is we've written this in a way that it's very, very modular. Um, so you can create any kind of back end to this into any kind of file store that you might have, including um, OwnCloud, and um, thus actually integrate this. The reason we did it this way is we needed something that would be slightly more modular and be able to pull into the other dialogue. So if you go into the mail composing dialogue, you actually have a little button that says attach from cloud. And there you have a file selector and which shows you the files in here. And you can just select that file and it just immediately attaches it um, to send out. You don't need to download and upload again. Same for, for things you receive. And those dialogues themselves are generated in this application layer and can be pulled into virtually any other web application. So it, um, it's a it's a, it's a set of um, predefined dialogues that can be fully skinned and integrated in any web application. It's a generic base for actually allowing you that kind of functionality in anything this module, like any other module, really can also run standalone and be fully skinned. <coughs> this is just how it then looks in, in native Cola web skin. Then, desktop. I deliberately chose a Windows screenshot here. Um, just because I can. Um, also because many people have never seen how contact looks on Windows. It looks actually really, really natural um, and natively integrated, all thanks to the powers of Qt. Qt allows you to fully integrate um, into um, virtually any platform, including um, the embedded ones. Uh, it's the only technology that I know that gives us this, uh, this power. And um, all of this is based on Qt. So um, this is the calendar view now. Obviously, the rest, you also know it's um, fairly Outlook equivalent in the way it looks and feels, which is for the very simple reason that the people who would be put in front of this are typically the same people who've been using Outlook for a long time. Um, so they don't have such a hard time to get used to something new. What we have done way before Outlook is strong cryptography. So um, Colab has for the largest um, time been pushing GNU-PG. A lot of the GNU-PG features, in fact, came out of Colab development projects. Um, so we've been working with the GNU-PG upstream for a long, long time. Werner Koch um, has um, very tight ties to many of the Colab developers over the years. And we do this on Windows, as well as, of course, um, in Linux and, um, and Mac. We can also use um, GNOME Evolution. There is a native connector, but I think the code quality there is perhaps not yet production ready. So um, I've seen other people use it through CalDAV, um, RDAF, so that works. Um, Thunderbird, CalDAV, RDAF as well, Mac OS X natively, uh, because they typically don't want another application, they want whatever's already on the platform. So it, it's the, the whole, um, when you're in corporate world, it's the whole bring your own device thing, right? People bring anything to work, they expect it to work. So you need to be able to actually interface with virtually anything and that's what we do um, because, well, it's how this world works today. Then I figured I would tell you a little bit about mycolab.com. Um, so we started mycolab.com. I mean, those who were around Fosdem might have seen it or not. I don't know. Um, but around Fosdem this year, we started mycolab.com as a cloud version of um, Cola, right? Based on the fact that we get a lot of people asking us, can I just get two accounts, three accounts, five accounts, whatever, um, of Cola, or you know, can I just run my business off a server that you run for me? And um, we saw that request often, but we didn't see anyone actually willing to answer it properly. Um, and we were figuring that um, there must be a different business model than this. Um, because we were sure, we were absolutely certain in January, uh, or before January, before we actually did this, 
that there must be a demand for people who prefer to not have the data analyzed, who want to keep their actual um, data to themselves, private, under control. And we wanted to provide this as a manner of service for the people who would be interested in this. Our principle here was very strong, do it right, so control the whole chain. That means we have gone to a Swiss data center that we can trust because we, we've looked at it, we've physically examined it. We have gotten a cage co-located there, that is our cage where only we have the keys. That cage we have filled with hardware that we own and we have set up. It is running fully free software. There's no proprietary element anywhere <coughs> there. Uh, so no hidden uh, stuff of any kind that any one of us would ever you know, know of. Um, and um, then set up proper, I mean, in the way that I showed you before, in how you can set up a pull-up server in a fairly distributed manner um, with different levels of access and staging and so on and so forth, and fully PFS, of course. But don't overpromise. Um, you see, the problem is that the realm we entered there is rife with um, over-marketing. Um, it's literally filled with snake oil. Um, it's really, really bad because what you see here is a lot of providers who claim security, right? But the moment you do a little bit of digging, you figure out they don't even run their own servers. They just run a virtual server somewhere that someone else has put on a hypervisor for them. Now, I mean, seriously, is it that secure? I mean, you, you have no idea what is happening on that hypervisor. Otherwise, you know, who has access to that machine? If you don't have physical control, you have no control. You need the whole chain to be stable, otherwise you have a problem. Um, then, of course, you have the, the likes of, oh, we have encrypted this on the server side for you, um, and so we can't even access your data. Um, this is the, uh, the same thing that, for instance, Lababit has done, and uh, I recommend to read the article by Moxie Marlinspike on the actual veracity of those claims, because I mean, I, we run such an installation, right? Um, we actually refuse to provide server-side keys and encryption for that reason. We say it doesn't actually add security. Um, and we don't believe in lying to you. Um, we, say, we say that in our FAQ, and for the simple reason that we feel this is all snake oil. Because if I have the encrypted data, I have the key and I have the passphrase. Really? Seriously. Um, so, we very clearly say, if you need this encrypted, encrypted on your local client, use, you know, local crypto, ideally a hardware token um, that you have in your hand and that cannot be easily compromised even by the platform you're running it on, um, because that is, if you want that level of security, that is how you get it. Um, you don't get it by putting your, your um, key up on a server somewhere. Um, so we very strongly try to avoid snake oil claims very much, um, and even though it's actually cost us some customers. I mean, we have some people who say, yes, I understand, but I want it anyway. It makes me feel better. Um, so that's, that's how it goes. But we launched in January, and the response was good. I mean, yeah, people were interested. You know, we got good feedback. People were really coming on, you know, things were looking very good. Excuse me, the point that you love a bit was that they didn't actually store any passwords, wasn't it? They said they did. <coughs> read, 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 read the article. Um, Moxy has done a, a full analysis of the whole thing. Um, there's also the, the part of not using PFS in there and things like that, which means if you get hands, your hands on the SSL key, you actually have all the traffic you have um, recorded before everything. So what, this is what we were building, right? Or, I mean, this is what we thought we were building. We were building this, you know, corporate SME realm product, um, you know, for SMEs who, who thought, you know, we would run this in a secure um, cloud kind of thing. Then this happened. All of a sudden. Um, and I mean, we, we all, uh, I mean, Virtually most of the people I see in this room, almost except the ones I, I mean, at least the ones I know, have noticed this effect very dramatically. So what we actually suddenly felt we were running is this. Um, I mean, 
th this is how it, how it felt like. I mean, especially when PJ closed down Groclaw and said, oh, and by the way, if you, if, if you, if you want to find me, uh, email me at, on mycolab.com. Um, I mean, uh, our virtual machine that runs the web server for mycolab.com just was swamped. I mean, it was so slashed on it. We went off the net for like half an hour. And on Twitter, there were already conspiracy theories that the NSA had gotten to us. <laughs> Serious. <laughs> it was a, a, a simple um, denial of service attack, um, but not of the nasty kind in this case. Um, it, it was just unexpected. So yes, we now have um, a user profile that is, includes the SMEs. <coughs> and in fact, quite a few SMEs also from the US who say, I, I find it atrocious that my own government is spying on me. Um, so yes, we have the SMEs. We have um, that, that corporate crowd, but we also now have a dramatic um, influx of um, lawyers um, worldwide, um, legal councils, including um, Queen's councils from the UK and, and other very distinguished ones. Um, we have journalists, quite a few of them as well, um, including a BBC World News editor who's been signing up to this. Um, quite <coughs> often they are using this to talk to their informants because, well, they need a place where they can do that. Um, so it's a very, very interesting um, uh, endeavor in that sense because for us it was a complete shockwave um, that changed the underlying feel of all of this very much from, you know, running this corporate SME, you know, you don't, you want a solid um, offering that is not being data mined um, by your competitors um, to, you know, suddenly we're running this refugee camp or, or the refuge of the free or whatever. Do you know if, if, if those users managed to do the local decrypt? Well, we don't monitor them, so um, <laughs> I don't really know. Um, what I do know from some feedback, and I mean, we get a lot of feedback actually. I mean, it, it's a, it, not to make it too very, there's a lot of happiness among them. And, um, sometimes we even get um, feedback <coughs> that it's almost like a love letter. And this is like people who pay you, right? I mean, they pay us a, a, a solid amount of money um, for their accounts, and um, they are happy to do it. I mean, we get mails like, I cannot tell you how happy I am to pay my invoice. Um, that's the kind of feedback that you really, really like when you run a business. But um, some of them get back to us and um, say, well, it's extremely hard to set this PGP stuff up. Um, and I am afraid I really, really, really have to agree with them, which is I hope uh, Mailpile will solve that problem to some level at least. Um, because increasing the usability of GNU PG is one of the things where we really, really, really have to step up. Um, I mean, I use it every day, and I know a lot of people who do, but let's be honest, it's not as usable as it should be. Um, we really need to do more there. So, um, I don't know who many or how many of them have managed. No, I know that some have done it. I know that some have struggled, um, but I have no statistics. But yes, so all the all the money that comes in through my collab, and you've seen that in one of the quotes, actually <coughs> then goes back into development as well. I mean, running the service, of course, but also development. Um, and so, just very briefly, our business. So we are. A company where you work with us, you know it makes more free software because we don't do proprietary. No open core ever. We don't like open core. We hate neo proprietary. We we deliberately hire people who are fairly strong minded about this as well. Uh, so long standing free software contributors. I mean, you will know some of our employees um, based on the communities you move in, but um, you will know them. Um, and all of us believe strongly in building technology that is 100% free software. So even our enterprise offering, which is the classic channel, right? Um, even that comes 100% free software just with a longer um, support cycle with some guaranteed updates with um, a phone number or an email address where someone will actually solve your problem. <coughs> so you get the guarantees and the support that you need if you want to run this professionally, but it is still 100% free. There's no proprietary elements left on anywhere. Um, we also do this as an ISP product, so white label, um, which means you know you can just brand this any way you want. No problem for us, and of course then the cloud offering, which is the MyCollab secure collaboration as a service 
um, was the actual initial thought of my making the small business secure cloud offering, but now we find a lot of professional users as well as high net worth individuals. I mean, this is also reseller friendly, so we have resellers who are doing IT and other security for high net worth individuals, aka rich people. Um, and um, apparently, uh, one of them told me that uh, now that apparently a Swiss bank account is the new it thing to have. Um, like the, the new, you know, the, the Swiss email account and the Swiss bank account are the two, you know, that you really, really want. Um, um, so it, it's trendy now to have your email account in Switzerland, apparently. Which, of course, we find entertaining, but um, there is some real value to it, though, because um, right now, legislatively, Switzerland is one of the best countries in the world to be hosting this kind of thing. <coughs> and that is it. I'm out of time. And on our slides, my contact details, the URLs. Thank you very much. Any questions, thoughts, ideas? Yes, please. Could you elaborate a bit more on that server side encryption? Because it sounds slightly like a fan saying we don't have you know, a lock on the door to the safe supporting box. Because you know, it's important that the user has the key to the bottom box, so we don't need you know, the door for it. Of uh, course, we have server side encryption, but only. Okay. Only I mean, not not of the um, not of the user level. You know, we encrypt it specifically for you, kind of thing. The number. I mean, right? We use everything that we know works, mm -hmm. and where we have a an actual expectation that this increases user security, that we do use. But the moment it becomes snake oil, we say no. So are all your development. Uh, physically located in, or your developers located in Germany? Um, we have, I mean, we are free software business. As such, we have some level of distribution. Plus, we're part of a larger company group, which is also distributed. So, um, one, in fact, one of the members of the company group is KDAP, the Swedish enterprise, um, with subsidiaries all across the world almost. <coughs> they have a US um, subsidiary, German one, um, now in the UK as well. So, I mean, it's, it's proud. We ourselves are um, in Europe firmly. Um, we have the core of our team in Switzerland, but we also have developers elsewhere. Um, some of them simply it's a matter of um, not wanting to abandon their lives with family. Um, it's, once you have a family and a house and your family has a life, Moving yourself and everyone with you becomes a rather daunting task, so we don't require that of them. Yes. I've been thinking about uh, Calda. Okay, so you know Cyrus nowadays <coughs> uh, recently implemented Calda server itself also, and I've been thinking maybe Dowcats should have Calda at some point, and you have your own Calda server. But okay, so the calendar application you have right now. Is it actually directly talking to IMAP or is it going through Caldav server? So Caldav is tricky to get right because Caldav has been oversold in what it can do um, on some level. Point is Caldav suffers from being <coughs> over and under specified at the same time. The um, encapsulated standards that are in there um, for calendaring um, have, well, they're committee driven to some level, right? That, if you know technology, you know that means that sometimes there's more than one way of solving the same problem, right? Um, that means if you just take a CalDAV object as it comes, and that is what most solutions do, and throw it into the server as it is, then you suddenly, in your, in your data set, inherit all the client incompatibilities of every single client and every version of that client that has ever connected to that server. Um, two years down the road, that's a maintenance nightmare, support nightmare par excellence. It's really painful. Um, because then, you know, that one client has this obscure problem with this one calendar, and it's getting really, really, really nasty. So what you need to do if you want to run a proper CalDAV service, you need to canonify the data that comes in, um, and then shoot it out at the client in the way that that client understands it. And sometimes you may even have to modify the data for the client if you know that that particular version of that particular client is broken. 
So if you ever want to implement that CalDAV server functionality, that is what you would have to keep in mind if you want to do it proper, which is why we only now did CalDAV, because um, just you know, opening a file, a, a DAV drop, you know, would be easy. And that's what Cyrus has done as well, right? So it, um, it, it's essentially, it's a local political issue because they wanted to make sure that, the, that Cyrus would not get thrown out of the university so they, and the people wanted to share the calendar, so they needed to show that they could do that in the Cyrus um, stack as well. Um, what I would recommend if you want to do this um, in Dovecut is that you actually look at what we've done in canonifying this kind of stuff and um, perhaps even work with us on, on, on making that happen. Because what we have here is essentially just the layer that does the, the DAV part, which is Saber DAV for most of us anyway. And that's the, the one library on which we all have more or less focus these days. Um, and then you have a little thin layer that canonifies it and then stores it in XML in the IMAP server. Um, and we can then, as we write it out, um, become client-specific if we must. Of course, we don't want to. We, we prefer that this is just a generic access and we try to solve things as generic as we possibly can make them, but we can't control all the clients out there. Um, and that's the big problem. So when you do CalDAV, be aware that these issues exist, and if and it, this is one of the things where you can build something that seems to work perfectly, very fast, and it just works, right? Because you have your one client, you connect it, it works, right? It, suddenly it works. I have a second PC, it uses the same client, same version, ideally even. It all works. But then you hook up another platform, another implementation, and you share a calendar with that person, and suddenly all hell breaks loose. And if you're um, if you're really uh, out of luck, that happens two years after you've accumulated lots of legacy data, um, and now you're in the hell of trying to somehow clean up that data. Um, that's really no fun. Um, that's why I say calendaring is a really hard problem. It's a really difficult problem to solve, right? Um, also, there's, for instance, I mean, time zone mapping, all this kind of stuff. So um, there's, a, um, there's a company that produces an Outlook connector via CalDAV. Um, and so we've, we've spoken to them, they're like, yeah, do you try it out, see whether it works. Um, and they say, yeah, but we write everything out to UTC. It's, to anyone technical, first of all, that sounds great, right? UTC, you know, fantastic, just one time zone to deal with, all this idiotic time zone shit is gone. Only that we made that mistake in the past, and we know why it's a mistake. Um, we have, we have um, modeled after the Python enhancement proposals. We have um, CoLab enhancement proposals, CAPS, and CAP number two. CAP one defines the process. CAP two explains why writing out in UDC is a really, really, really bad idea. Um, because you essentially, how do I say this? You essentially create a virtual time zone that isn't actually UTC, but that inherits all the local time zone troubles from every time zone around the world. Um, because what people specify an appointment, they usually mean a time at a place. Um, you, need, you need to show the user what their intention was, right? Not what it was in UTC at the time when they expressed that intention. Um, and if that changes later, that's not your problem. The user expects when he says 11 o'clock in Berlin, he expects that to be 11 o'clock in Berlin, no matter whether in the US they change the local time zone rules as they've done around um, the, the second Iraq war to, because they were pissed off at the Europeans, so they changed the, the time switching interval, right? So now there's a couple of weeks between us. We used to switch in sync, but they actually now have, have unsynced that. Um, there's all sorts of things going on there. And if you then share calendars with someone in a different time zone that switches to at a different time, and you only have a UTC time and no idea how to interpret that, you're screwed. Um, so it all works as long as everyone's in the same time zone, fine. The moment you switch time zones, the moment you start to become international, you're in a world of hurt. Um, you can't resolve it, you cannot fundamentally resolve it because the data that you would need to resolve it is gone, it's missing. Um, so that's why, Colab 3 actually stores everything as the intended time. So we have a you know, place in there that says, you know, this time zone, you're Berlin, in, in the Olsen database, essentially, which is the most standardized way of expressing um, time zone information in that sense. And then say, you know, that time in that, in, in, at that place. And if I want to express UTC, because I want to actually say, 
we will meet UTC no matter what that translates to because we're a large national company and I don't care what your local time lord is, that meeting would have to be to block UTC and express that. But that's the rare exception. Um, should not be how your application does it by default. So that's you know why um, there's a whole lot of trickery involved in here where you need to be very careful which design choices you make because later on otherwise it gets very messy to clean up. Yes. A question about my collab. Um, people people have been asking the Mailtel project whether we're going to be offering email addresses and hosting for them. And my reaction to that is generally, oh my god, no, I don't want to do that, then I become a target. You guys are setting yourselves up to any targets. Are you not uncomfortable about that? Are you doing anything to deal with that? Because it's a dirty job, but someone has to do it. Um, <laughs> it's, no, I just want to ask um, It's ultimately something where, um, yes, of course, we are setting ourselves up as a target. In fact, once um, the whole um, Miranda thing happened in London, um, we immediately set up a procedure whereby an admin in transit is, no, <coughs> is no longer an admin. Um, so our admins, when they travel, lose all access privileges to our systems, fully. Um, only once they're back in a safe location and we can be sure they have not been detained, actually do they get their passwords back. Um, because the problem otherwise is um, that if, if in the UK law makes it a criminal offense not to give them a password, the only way to comply with the law is to not have the password surrender. So now they can say, yeah, no problem here, all my passwords, they're all useless, none of them work. And that's ultimately how we handle that kind of issue. But yes, yes, we are thinking about this, and yes, we are very much um, concerned about some of these issues. We try to you know, protect ourselves, our users, our staff as much as we can, but um, at the end of the day, um, if no one is willing to run that kind of service at the same time, you know, that would kind of suck as well. You said something about Wallace. Is that like a mail uh, What's the connection there? I guess in a way it is a little bit like Milford, yes. Um, so it's the same on the different standard? Not quite. I mean, it's... Um, You'd have to talk to um, our architect for why exactly he um, chose to, to, to solve this problem this way. There's some very peculiar, specific things that he needed in that application um, in the way that it handles it. But uh, because it also interacts with the, with the daemon, because when you do calendaring, then you also need to be able to like um, say, um, look at invitations that are coming in and perhaps do something based upon them when you do resource management, right? Like book the car. Um, then that car should behave as a kind of auto-responsive thing and should detect, okay, there's now a response coming in, what do I do? Um, so that there, was, there was something in that realm that made him choose to um, do this as a Python uh, module, um, which is fairly simply uh, um, dealt with, but then this is not exclusive, right? You can hook as many um, things into your PostFix mail for as you want, so. But you can adapt uh, a to the Perhaps you could, um, and if you, if you want to take that on, you know that would be great. Hey, this 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 is a free software project. So I mean, any, anything. So we've been working very hard for the past two years to get, um, I mean, to always mainstream, 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 mainstream to the maximum extent possible. Because one of the mistakes that Kolak made in the in the past was that it had, in some ways, taken too often the slightly too easy route of just doing it yourself. Um, and that is what Colab 2 suffered from. So that's why the first thing we did when we took over with the new crew was just mainstream, 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 mainstream into the distributions um, wherever and however we can um, because we just want this up in you know, the, the most mainstream place that we can find ultimately. Um, that's what we've been doing very consciously, deliberately, and we'll always do that for wherever we can. Okay.